With your host, Andrew Donaldson, this is Heard Tell. Uh, it's our tell. It's July the 26th. That's a Tuesday in the year of our Lord 2022. I'm Andrew Donaldson. Thank you so much for joining us on this edition of Herd Tell. However you are watching or listening, wherever you are across the street around the world, thrilled you're with us. Thank you so much for giving us the most precious thing you have, your time. And we're going to do a lot of turning down the noise of the news cycle today on a lot of different topics for you. Uh, covering stories today, I'm going to go to Myanmar, the other side of the world. Uh, the ruling junta uh, military has started executing their political prisoners from last year's protests and dissident. Very ugly situation over there. We're going to touch into that. We're going to talk about monkeypox and the way social media and the news media are both setting us all up for failure for this particular health crisis that is coming upon us uh on the news today a lot of economic stuff going on so we're going to go to one of our really good economic contributors uh alex salter young voices contributor he is a professor of economics at texas tech been on the program before just been a little while thrilled to death to have him we're going to talk about inflation we're going to talk about terminology we're going to talk about how the language of economics and the way we're discussing it isn't really relating to what's happening and the fact that what's happening even the economics is very weird this is a very unique situation situation, how to talk about it, what's noise, what's real, what we need to know about, what we don't need to know about. Alex Salters is our guest on the program today. Absolutely thrilled to have him. Also ending the program today, we always end on a good note. We've covered a couple times. Uh, the gaming uh, streaming platform Twitch has raised tens of millions of dollars doing fundraising things and game streams and things like this. They're changing how they do donations and fundraising on that website. Important news on a cutting edge technology. It's where all the cool kids are. They're on Twitch. Uh, we'll cover that in the final segment. But first, I want to start right here because we're going to cover some other stuff today. Uh, Civil War is trending all over social media again, and I've just had it with these people. Folks, one of the most traumatic things that's ever happened in our country is the Civil War. And we brought it upon ourselves, both because of the things that led up to it and the way it was the way it was conducted and our failure to heal the wounds and properly reset our country after and the complete disaster that was Reconstruction. Civil wars are awful. I have been in countries overseas that have civil wars going on. When I was there, it's bloody, awful, brutal business. Nobody should ever joke or use for a political pun a civil war. And you can say, well, just, no, 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 there's nothing funny about a civil war. People die. They're bloody. They're ugly. What we have online is a lot of people that are lazy and they're upset and they have grievances, but they have complicated their inconveniences and grievances into things when they start talking about civil war that want to ruin the country that I love. I will never tolerate this. I will never think it's okay. And I will oppose them always to the very end. You don't get to destroy our country just because you're mildly aggravated about something. Just because you have the additional and disposable income to go to rallies, buy merchandise, and get this stuff force-fed down your throat. But don't take my word for it. Let me bring you two people who know a lot about the Civil War. William Tecumseh Sherman, who prosecuted it for the Union, who drove through the South, who understood modern warfare better than most of the generals at the time. He said this about the South before the war ever began. You are bound to fail. Only in your spirit and determination are you prepared for war. In all else, you are totally unprepared and with a bad cause to start with. That applies to these folks. But if you don't want to listen to me and you don't want to listen to Sherman, maybe you'll listen to U.S. Grant. He was also president, although he had a corruption-addled administration. But he knew what he was talking about in Civil War the defining moment of his life in many ways. Ulysses S. Grant said this, If we are to have another contest in the near future of our national existence, I predict the dividing line will not be Mason and Dixon's, but between patriotism and intelligence on one side and superstition, ambition, and ignorance on the other. Well, that seems like a pretty good means test. Let's apply it. When somebody starts talking about civil war, when somebody starts talking about dividing our country or a divorce of our country, which is just one step down and equally ignorant. 
when anybody talks about not wanting to be America anymore just because they're not getting their way, let's apply this means test. Is it because of patriotism and intelligence that they're bringing this up? Or is it superstition, ambition, and ignorance? Almost every account I see advocating for civil war, advocating for national divorce, or advocating that America isn't good enough for them because of this, that, or another reason anymore, almost always I find it to be based on superstition, ambition, or ignorance. Work better to have a more free and fair America that gives as much liberty and freedom to the most people possible because there isn't anywhere else in the world that has a better chance of doing it than this country does. As imperfect as we've been, as bad as our history has been on some areas, we're still the last best hope for freedom in the world today. Because if this fails, there ain't nowhere else to go. So no, you can't have your civil war and you can't have your national divorce. We're not going to allow it because we love freedom. We love liberty. We love our country way too much to indulge you on your fantasies. More heard tell right after this. Welcome back to Herod Tell. Just a note on a story we're going to be covering later on in another program. Uh, Monkeypox is getting all over the news, but it's getting all over social media for all the wrong reasons. We're going to touch on this later because it's a little more in-depth. We want to talk to some folks about it. We want to make sure we get the story fully straight. But we're seeing some disturbing stuff on social media about monkeypox. It has nothing to do with the disease and how it's spread. It has to do with how people are slamming it into their priors and how they want to talk about culture war type issues. Folks, don't do this. It's a disease. Find out what the actual ins and outs of the disease are and stick to that. Don't go off trying to get into mass culture stuff with a disease. These are still people that are sick and they deserve to have a little bit of humanity put on them. There is a history in the United States of America and our political and social commentary of really ugly stuff when it comes to communicable diseases. We can go back and look at how the AIDS crisis was treated in the 80s and 90s, and we can look at how we just treated each other for the better part of two years over COVID. If you start othering people because they do or do not have an illness, you're going down a very dark road of dehumanizing people, and you're not really gaining anything other than tearing folks up that need health care and need concern. Crisis like health crisis doesn't need the flames of people's priors and people's prejudices thrown all over the top of it. Go, go listen to our friend David Hubble. We just re-upped that over the weekend, who has been surviving with HIV since 1985. He's one of the longest living HIV uh, infected people in America. He tells you firsthand what it was like in the 80s and 90s when people didn't know any better and just ran with their prejudices instead of trying to deal with people who were sick and needed help. It's an ugly road. Don't go down it. Stick to the facts, learn how the disease does and does not work, learn who it does and doesn't affect, and then remember, you never lose social media points for saying nothing at all if you don't have anything nice to say. It is a crisis, but it's not a crisis that needs to be blown out of proportion, not only by government officials and news people that are looking to keep themselves in the headlines, but by people who want to just attack other groups of people they don't like over it. Keep your bearing, folks. Keep your humanity. And as always, turn down the noise. Just deal with the facts. Let's go back overseas to Myanmar, a country that's been in turmoil for quite a while now, and it's getting even uglier. Uh, this is from Reuters. Uh, Myanmar's military junta has executed four democracy activists accused of helping to carry out, quote, terrorist acts. That's in quotes for a reason. It is said on Monday, sparking widespread condemnation of the Southeast Asian nation's first execution in decades, sentenced to death in closed-door trials, in January and April, that's when there was some really heavy protests and uprisings, the four men had been accused of helping insurgents to fight the army that seized power in a coup last year and unleashed a bloody crackdown on its opponents. Myanmar's National Unity Government, a shadow administration outlawed by the ruling junta, condemned the executions and called for international actions against the ruling military. Quote, extremely saddened, condemned the junta's cruelty, Kawaza, the spokesman for the NUG's presidential office, told Reuters, the global community must punish their cruelty. Among those executed were democracy campaigner Kwai Min Yu, better known as Jimmy, a former lawmaker and hip-hop artist, 
Fiozia Thaw. I apologize if I'm mispronouncing any of these. The Global New Light of Myanmar newspaper said. Uh, Kai Min Yun, 53, and Fai Zio Thon, uh, a 41-year-old ally of ousted leader Aung San Suu Kai, lost their appeals against the sentence in June. Two others were executed when Lao Mao Ang and Ang Thuro Za were also executed. These executions amount to arbitrary deprivation of lives and are another example of Myanmar's atrocious human rights record, said Erwin van der Braa, regional director of the group Amnesty International. The four men were convicted by a military court in a secretive and deeply unfair trial. The international community must act to prevent similar executions of over 100 people believed to be on death row and convicted of similar proceedings. I doubt that happens. The international community hasn't intervened in the last year or in the years prior. I don't think they're going to now, but it's still outrageous. Uh, the men were held in the colonial era Aizim prison, and the person with knowledge of the event said their families visited last Friday. Only one relative was allowed to speak to the detainees via an online platform. State media reported on the executions on Monday, and the junta spokesman Zhao Min Toon later confirmed the sentences to the voice of Miramar. Neither gave details of the timing. Previous executions in Miramar had been by hanging. An activist group, the Assistant Association of Political Prisoners, said Miramar's last judicial executions were in the late 80s. Um, this is pretty part and parcel for what happens after a crackdown in a dictatorship. Uh, the military has cracked down. Now they're going to drive the point home by executing some of the leaders and more high profile people. I suspect this continues as they continue to try to get a grip on this country. Tyranny always without exception leads to bloodshed, often unwarranted and innocent bloodshed. Keep an eye on this developing story because most of the world isn't paying attention to it. And despite the cries from some of these organizations, I doubt they're going to do anything about it. But we should know what's going on in the world around us. More Hertel right after this. Ah, welcome back to Hertel. Okay, been a minute since he's been here, but we're thrilled to have him back because he's always sharp, always has good information. He is both an assistant professor of economics and a research fellow down at Texas Tech, which he reminded me of because I'm wearing my West Virginia shirt, Alexander Zalter. Great to have you back, my friend. How are you? Thank you very much. I'm doing really well. I'm excited to be back. Also, yeah, well, guns up. <laughs> there ain't no shortage of economic stuff to talk about. I want to start here, though, because we've talked to you about this before. And one of the reasons we love having you on is you explain it so even I can understand this stuff. This stuff gets data set heavy. It gets terminology heavy. It gets philosophical heavy when we start talking economics. Let's start common parlance and nomenclature because we're having a fight right now today as we record this. What is and isn't a recession? We talk about what is and isn't good economic. Do we have a language? I had a math teacher years ago said math is a language. Well, if math is a language, then I don't know what economics is because that's a math-based discipline. Do we have a language problem discussing economics in America right now? We have several problems when discussing economics in America right now. The recession definition one's a little bit interesting since, of course, you could define it multiple different ways. There are several U.S. statutes that say for the purposes of recording national income statistics, et cetera, we define a recession as two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth. But just because that's a definition doesn't mean that that's the universally accepted definition. Economists sort of use that as a rule of thumb. But again, there's wiggle room in what we officially count as a recession. Right now is actually a really good example of why we need that wiggle room. If the GDP numbers for the second quarter in the row come in negative, we're going to be looking at a contracting economy at the same time that we don't really have any notable uptick in unemployment. The unemployment rate in the United States right now is 3.6%. That's incredibly low. It would be weird on the one hand to have a recession where you're having dropping output combined with what looks to be pretty strong labor market. So that's, that's unusual. Do we call that a recession? Do we call that a sort of retrenching of production as we sort of undo these supply chain problems? Reasonable people can disagree. Is that part of what's going on here too, though, is we haven't had a lot of times where you have something. This this has been blowing everybody's mind for 
about a year now. Low unemployment, but high inflation, kind of a touchy labor market, even though unemployment's low. This is just an unusual time. Is part of the problem we're using the terminology we always use, and we use the terms we always use, and it just doesn't quite fit what's really happening here because it's not normal. In many ways, the terms that we all use separately do a good job of describing the individual phenomenon. Right? We are experiencing inflation right now. Unemployment is low right now, et cetera. The problem is when you try and package it, package it all together and try and use a single all-encompassing term or concept to describe everything. Recession doesn't very clearly to me describe what's going on right now, even if you have falling output, because again, we're used to seeing rising unemployment in a recession. So that's kind of weird. At the same time, the inflationary numbers being as high as they are, at the same time you're seeing unemployment numbers being what they are, that's something that's a little bit historically strange. Now, uh, part of the reason that we find this so weird is actually the fault of us economists. We, we owe the public an apology on that one. Economists in the public square have been saying for ages, look, there's this trade-off between inflation and unemployment. Usually when one is low, the other is high. When the other one's low, the first one's high. But it's just not true. There is no inherent trade-off between the rate of joblessness on the one hand and how fast the dollar is depreciating on the other hand. You can have low inflation and good employment numbers. There's no reason those two things can't go together. And in fact, the reason that one of those inflation has gotten unhinged, I would say, is more the result of bad policy decisions rather than something that's baked into the cake. Yeah, you were writing about this in uh, American Institute for Economic Research, that very thing. And you noted here and explain it to people because words like inflation and recession are just scary to people. They scare folks. They don't like it, especially folks that are a little bit older that have been through a recession before, or been through a downturn before, or been through the 08 financial crisis. These things are scary, but you actually put it in this piece. There's actually nothing really special about 2% inflation. Kind of explain and unpack that for folks a little bit. Yeah. So the central bank, the Federal Reserve has a self-adopted 2% average inflation target. Basically, what that means is they're shooting for an average inflation rate of 2% over a number of years. But there's really nothing special about that number 2%. It's kind of like a traffic light, right? Red means stop, green means go. Is there any reason it has to be the case? Not really, right? You could envision a traffic system where red means go and green means stop. But given that we've already coordinated around one system of traffic lights, there's no sense in throwing a wrench in those particular set of gears. Right? That would just cause trouble. It's the same for inflation. What we're really looking for is a given rate of change for the purchasing power of the dollar around which to coordinate expectations. So as long as everybody expects the number that the Fed actually delivers, pretty much everything's hunky-dory. It could be 2%, it could be 4%, it could even be 0%. It could even be negative, right? Slight deflation is not a problem so long as everybody knows that it's coming. So we have to get away from this idea that there's this magic one right inflation rate that we need policymakers to tinker with the economy until we hit it. In reality, markets are flexible. And as long as there's credible commitment to a given policy, we can figure things out by writing our contracts differently, adjusting the wage expectations we have when we go looking for jobs. There's a lot that we can do as long as we get credible, predictable policy. Yeah. Alexander Salter joining us, economist from Texas Tech, Young Voices contributor, superstar contributor. He's on the, you've moved up to the header, I noticed on the website, by the way. Congratulations. Uh, our economist friend Jericho Hill talking about the Fed, since we're using traffic as an analogy, let's just beat that to death a little bit more. He said what the Fed's doing right now is kind of like a car. You're trying to not slam into the car in front of you while not getting rear ended by the car behind you. And that's what they're doing with the interest rates. We've been doing that for a little while now. They keep raising interest rates. They're going to probably raise them some more. Where do you think we're at in that process, if that's the analogy we're using? Are we too close to the front? Are they getting us where we're going to get rear-ended? How do you think they're doing right now as we sit today? That's a great question. My perspective on this is actually kind of contrarian in that I think that whatever the Fed is doing to its target for its key policy interest rate doesn't matter anywhere near as much as what they're doing to their balance sheet. We have this idea because economists write about it and financial journalists write about it, that the Fed controls interest rates, but they don't. They have a target range for what they want one key policy interest rate to be, but the Fed doesn't have the power to arbitrarily set the federal funds rate, the rate at which banks loan each other money on an overnight basis. 
right? Interest rates, even short-term interest rates are set in global capital markets. And even a very powerful central bank like the Fed is more following than leading those markets. Where I do think the Fed has more leeway is in the overall size of its balance sheet, just the total value of assets that they have on that side of their particular accounting ledger. Right now, the Federal Reserve is holding about $9 trillion in assets. For a comparison, before the financial crisis of 2008, the Fed's balance sheet was under a trillion. So over the past 10 plus years, we've seen a massive expansion in the importance of the central bank for creating money and allocating credit. And I would argue that that's not something that's economically sustainable or desirable. So if we want to figure out whether the Fed is serious about whipping inflation or not, I think that we should be talking less about what they're doing to their interest rate target and more about whether they're actually letting those assets to roll off their books and without actually replenishing them. We need that balance sheet to come down or at minimum grow much more slowly than it has been in recent years. You wrote about it in your piece. We're linking to this in the show notes, by the way. Make sure you read this piece. It's an entirety at the American Institute for Economic Research. You talk a lot about the Fed's credibility. We talk about Congress's credibility. We're debating the Supreme Court's credibility. When it comes to the Fed, though, talking credibility, this isn't just you know us in the commentary talking about it. That has a lot of real world implications when you're talking about the Fed. Just for people that don't know, why is the Fed's credibility so important when it comes to monetary policy? Absolutely. Fed credibility is incredibly important because ultimately good monetary policy is about delivering what people expect, right? There's no one right purchasing power of the dollar. The purchasing power of the dollar could fall within a big range. What matters is that everybody has a reasonable expectation of what that number is so that they can then go out and write their contracts in financial markets with that piece of data as a given, right? The dollar in some ways is like a yardstick. If you had the definition of a yard constantly changing, you wouldn't be able to measure anything. You need some fixed unit of measurement so you know how expensive or cheap goods and services are. And ultimately, we need Fed credibility to forecast what that future purchasing power of the dollar is going to be. The problem is that the Fed's rule that it's picked, it doesn't really seem committed to in practice. So again, August 2020, the Federal Reserve adopts an average 2% inflation target. What that means is they're not trying to create 2% inflation each year. They're trying to hit 2% inflation on average over a number of years. The reason that's a problem right now is because inflation is running way hotter than 2%. So if they actually want to hit that average inflation target, assuming that we have an August 2020 start date, we're going to need several years of way below 2% inflation and perhaps even slight deflation. Is that credible? Can we expect central bankers to actually deliver low inflation or even deflation? Absolutely not. Monetary policymakers are terrified of deflation. Monetary policymakers are frankly not all that excited about low and predictable inflation. So they've committed themselves to a rule that based on the basic arithmetic of the scenario, they can't possibly deliver on, which means that markets, which already know that, have no reason to trust the Fed when they say, hey, we're trying to deliver 2% inflation. Markets are going to say, no, you're not. Look at what inflation is right now. There's no way that you can deliver 2% on average. So in effect, the Fed is trying to convince markets of something, uh, of a rule that the Fed itself has no buy-in for maintaining. And that's not a great place to be, right? Because when the Fed says one thing and delivers another, that's exactly when we get traffic jams in financial markets. That's exactly when we start rear-ending each other. That causes no end of economic trouble. See how he works the analogy right back in there at the end. He's a pro, folks. Uh, Alexander Salter joining us. We're talking economics. We're going to talk about that cohesion of policy like everything else. Coherent policy is important, and we don't have it. We're going to get into that more on the economy, on inflation. Alexander Salter joining us right after this break on Hurt Tell. We're continuing to talk economics with our friend Alexander Salter. He is a professor and research fellow down at Texas Tech. 
Uh, let's zoom back out for just a second, because I think we need to get a little perspective on something. And this isn't just applying to economics. It's kind of built into our system, and we lose perspective on this a little bit, whether it's foreign policy, whether it's monetary policy, whatever. Because of our system of government, we have, compared to a lot of countries in the world, we have a lot of high turnover. We have a new president election every four years, Congress every two years. There's a lot. So getting coherent policy, it's just kind of baked into the cake of our system that coherent, consistent policy is going to be a challenge no matter what. The idea of the Fed was to be kind of a layer on top of that, but that doesn't seem to really be happening right now, does it? There's a lot of inconsistencies in terms of what we're getting in the economy. Although though we do have a lot of turnover in politicians, one thing that seems to be more or less a bipartisan consensus is deficit spending, right? Since 2020, since the coronavirus pandemic, we've run approximately $6 trillion in deficits. Those deficits were bipartisan. It's one thing for Republicans to be saying now that we have to focus on fiscal sanity and fiscal sustainability. They were voting for these blowout spending bills a year ago and two years ago. So it might be good politics for one party to say that they're committed to fiscal restraint and budgetary prudence, but it's just not true. Unfortunately, we have two parties that are considered uh, committed to breaking the bank. As for what the Fed is doing, ideally, they would be able to take a longer time horizon, but really, they just don't seem all that confident in what they're doing. At first, they insisted inflation was transitory. Then they said, okay, maybe it's here, but it's not going to be that bad. Okay, now it's here, and it's really, really bad, and we need to go pedal to the metal on controlling it. Now, actually, I'm okay in terms of pedal to the metal on controlling it. I am an inflation hawk myself. The problem is the rapid changes in the de facto policy regime, right? the basic stance about what monetary policymakers are actually trying to do. Talk about giving markets whiplash. How is anybody supposed to be able to form a plan about the future if monetary policymakers decide they're going to do one thing on Monday and another thing on Wednesday? So in combination with fiscal profligacy, I think that we've got a lot of money mischief coming from the central bank right now, and that goes a long way to explaining the unfortunate inflation numbers that we're seeing and I suspect are going to continue to see. Yeah, but you know, like we say on this program all the time, things don't happen in a vacuum. They happen in a sequence. COVID was the crisis. COVID was the excuse. Our financial house wasn't in order before that, so our Congress and our government kind of had learned behavior from us, the voting public, that they were going to be just fine doing something like that because they've had decades and decades of learned experience that that's what you do. You spend money and make a big show of it, and then you go campaign on that big dollar sign that you voted on. That's been the reality for all of my life. I'm 42 years old, and from at least the 90s when I first started paying in politics. This is the game. They talk about it, kind of, but spending money is how you get things done in government. That's a generational problem more than an economic problem, isn't it? I mean, that's just kind of the cycle we're stuck in. I don't know how you un that. Do you have any good ideas of how to un that? Because we use that great buzzword, fiscal responsibility, but it's like raising your kid. If you didn't teach him as a kid and you didn't teach him as a teenager and you didn't teach him as a young adult, the middle-aged guy buying boats and all this stuff, you're going to have a hard time pitching financial accountability to that guy, right? Sadly, you're right. Deficit spending, spending on our means is something that has become basically entrenched in the fiscal appropriations process at this point. And I'm worried that nothing short of a bond market crackdown is going to solve it. I hope that we don't get to that point. One of the things that we're observing right now is rising interest rates across all classes of securities. That's what you would tend to expect as inflation goes up. The problem is, as interest rates go up, Uncle Sam's borrowing costs go up too. And if trends continue in terms of the rate that Uncle Sam is paying on loans, that means a larger and larger share of the discretionary portion of the government budget is just going to be paying back interest on debt already incurred. That's going to make our political fights worse, not better. So I'm actually thinking that once we get a budgetary squeeze out of all this, that's going to increase partisan rancor. And that's something that I'm personally not looking forward to. Ultimately, we have to get big spending under control. And at the end of the day, Congress is going to do what gets people elected. So I think that you're also right that part of the problem here is with we the people. We also pretend that we care a lot about fiscal sustainability and budgetary prudence, and then we just vote for politicians who spend and spend without taxing. As long as we keep on doing that, politicians are going to keep on behaving the same. So until you get the actual voting public to realize this cannot continue and you are not going to like what happens if we have a sudden stop. Until you convince a critical mass of voters of that, I'm frankly not sure how you fix the problem. 
Yeah, but uh, when you studied economics coming up, you also studied the history of economics. Economics is just the study of people and money, really, when you break it down, even though it's a lot of math. You know this. I know this. Anybody that's honest knows about this. The public isn't going to do anything until it hurts or they're scared it's going to hurt one or the other. And I just don't, I mean, I want to be optimistic about this, but I'm looking at the trajectories. I'm looking at some of the fiscal crises that are already baked into the cake, like Medicare spending, like entitlement spending, like the $6 trillion we just dumped on the economy the last two, three years. That was bipartisan, like you pointed out. Like, you're looking at this stuff, and I'm a layperson. You're the economist. You tell me. I'm just looking at this like, this is not a far-term problem now. This is near-term next decade next five to 15 years this, this stuff is rolling closer and closer and closer do you see that as an economist as well this isn't something in the 90s where they were talking about 2020 2030 we're in 2022 so even if you're using that 2026 number for medicare and 2030 for the budgetary issues man that's the next election cycle we're there aren't we we're getting pretty close again interest rates are going up we're confronting the fact that we have lots and lots of unfunded liabilities that we have to pay for, that we currently can't pay for. You're right. The way that this gets really salient for the public is that something goes wrong and all of a sudden these budget constraints start to pinch and pinch hard. The ideal scenario would be to do something about it before then. And this is one of the nice things when you're a government as opposed to a household and a business. You don't actually have to get your fiscal house in order as quickly. We could actually start to get fiscal appropriations and deficit spending under control if we just grew the federal budget more slowly. We don't even have to make cuts. If the economy is growing at 3%, assuming that it starts growing at 3% per year, federal spending can grow at something less than 3% and the debt to GDP ratio will come down on its own. On the one hand, you have the tax base growing at the economy. On the other hand, you have tax spending, right? Government spending growing. As long as this hand grows faster than this hand, you're on a fiscally sustainable trajectory. So I'm hopeful that we might be able to come to a consensus around at least that relatively minor behavior change, that relatively easy policy change before stuff starts to get really bad. There are think tanks doing important works about uh, work about passing responsible budgets, especially at the state level. And a lot of those models might be able to help us at the federal level too. One example that I like is there are several states whose uh, politicians have committed to not growing their budgets more than the combination of the sum of inflation and population growth, which basically means they're keeping government spending and inflation adjusted dollars per person the same, basically a government spending freeze on a per capita basis. And so that might be the kind of thing that we need to implement just so we can catch our breath a little bit from these decades of deficit spending. Yeah, Alexander Salter joins. Okay, let's end on some good news though, because that was a lot of doom and gloom, and I don't like I don't like to go there, but we got to live in Realville, right? Uh, give us some positives in the economy though, because there is one of the reasons this is so weird is, and I know there's a lot of people hurting, so I don't be flipping about this, but overall, if you looked at some of the raw, the economy isn't in all that bad of shape historically. Un unemployment is low, spending is up, consumer spending is pretty steady. Give us some good news on the economy and some things to be looking for that are positive out there as well, because we don't want to just be all doom and gloom because it's not. One of the really interesting things, like you just said, is although there appears to be an economic slowdown, labor markets aren't hurting. It's unfortunate that inflation has reduced workers' wages somewhat, especially over the past year. But I, I'm hopeful that as long as we have continued strong labor markets, that's going to be able to put workers in a stronger bargaining position so they can get some of that purchasing power back. So in terms of what we're going to actually get, whether the Fed manages to give us a soft lending, whether we're going to fall into a recession, however we define it, I'm keeping my eye on, on labor force participation. I'm keeping my eye on unemployment. I'm keeping my eyes on all these indicators of labor market health. And right now, those look pretty good. And as long as those numbers hold up, I'm going to be comparatively optimistic about the short-term economic pain. Maybe this particular slowdown isn't going to hurt so much. And that's going to give us a little bit of wiggle room to also tackle the problems that we know we have to confront. Exhibit A, of course, is inflation. That number's got to come down. Yeah. Okay. So the $2 trillion questions right now, uh, we know the recession, that's not a recession that we're not, uh, to quote my buddy, Seth Mandel, he said, recession is only recession if it comes from the recession in region of France and otherwise it's just you know sparkling misery but 
is this the worst of it? Have we peaked out? Is inflation going to come down? Is this going to be the bad one? And then we start coasting down or do we have some more bad to come yet? If you force me to make a prediction, which I'm legendarily bad at, like many economists, so I'm in good company there. If you force me to make a prediction, I'm going to say that we're going to have lackluster economic output for a couple of quarters. We're going to see unemployment go up, but not to worrying levels. And the inflation rate is going to peak in the next couple of months and start gradually coming down. I don't think that we're going to get down to 2% anytime soon. I would be shocked if we came down to 3% by the end of next year. But it is possible to make committed policy changes to start getting control over some of these variables. The central bank can control inflation without throwing a wrench in the economy's gears. It's just a matter of paying attention to that balance sheet and making sure that they shrink it responsibly. I'm also hopeful that political pressure coming up to the midterms forces the Biden administration to maybe ease off on some of its uh, more stringent anti-business restrictions that they have adopted since 2020. We might be able to uh, anticipate something like the remarkable pivot that Bill Clinton engaged in after Republican uh, Republicans in Congress gave him a whipping in 1996. So if something like that happens, we might actually be able to get some bipartisan compromises on specific regulatory issues that ease business restrictions, make it easier to produce. And remember, when it gets easier to produce, it also gets easier to work and purchase and consume. And all of those things would sort of blunt the force of whatever headwinds are against us in the economy. Yeah, but you'd have to have a uh, you have to have politicians that are astute politically like Clinton to look at that money train after that beat and go, there's still time for me to jump on that and get credit for all this stuff that Congress is doing. I remember that 98 was my first election. So I remember those times. Well, um, responsible shrinkage, by the way, would be an excellent name for a book. You might want to look into that. Might copyright that. Uh, he's Alexander Salter. He is a professor down at Texas Tech, brings great information. He also has a book out, Money and the Rule of Law. Go check that out. We'll link all that. Until we get you back on, my friend, it won't be as long as last time, I promise. Uh, let folks know where they can follow you and what you've got going on until we see you again on Hertel. Sure. Right now, the best place to stay in touch with me is through the writings at my website. My website is www.awsalter.com. Uh, pretty much everything I've ever written is available there. You can find my popular articles. You can even find my scholarly articles if you feel, uh, feel like wading through those. You'll find my email address there. I'm happy to hear from listeners and readers chatting with people via email i don't have twitter anymore so you won't be able to find me on the bird site don't worry young voices has got it too we'll put a link to their twitter which they will be putting this out he's a prolific writer he really is he has stuff all over the place um go look his stuff up we love having you on my friend great talking again uh we may even talk during football season we'll see how it goes might have to you know put the friendship on hold uh, appreciate your time sir thank you so very much thank you andrew that was great yes sir thank you Back to her tell. Let's go back to Uvalde, the Rob Elementary School shooting for a second. This is an op-ed that came out in the Washington Post on July the 25th. It is written by Christy E. Lopez, a columnist. She's from Georgetown. I don't agree with everything in this piece. In fact, I disagree with her premise in a couple of different important ways, and I especially disagree with her conclusion. But I'm going to read a large portion of this piece. Why am I doing that if I disagree with that? Because our core principle here is to have wide perspective to understand our times. Even though I disagree with it, I've heard this argument in other places. She lays it out well, and it's worth hearing out. Even though I disagree with it, we're going to go through it because it's a different perspective than what I've been saying on this program about Uvalde. And I've been banging that drum pretty hard for a lot of good reasons. So I'm going to read part of this piece. We're going to link to it in the show notes. Please read it in its entirety and make up your own mind. But this is Christy Lopez writing in the Washington Post about Uvalde. Uh, Uvalde offers a dramatic illustration of the gap between the rhetoric and reality of American policing. Again, I'm reading from the Washington Post. This is Christy's op-ed, not mine. Police officers see danger and run to meet it, knowing the cost and stepping forward to pay it, the report states at the outset and then proceeds to contradict this lofty assertion. Quick pause, we have we read large portions of that report on Hertel. Go find that episode if you want to hear it. 
It also links to the PDF. You can read it for yourself. It's about 70 odd pages. Back to uh, Chrissy Lopez's op-ed in the Washington Post. To be sure, countless police officers perform bravely every day. Even though my career is focused on police misconducts, I count many officers among my most self-sacrificing caring people I know. But I have learned also that it is despite not because of the dominant dynamics in policing. Long before Uvalde, there has been complaints that even when on site, police do not always intervene to prevent ongoing assault, assaults. Indeed, the 2005 case Castle Rock versus Gonzalez, the Supreme Court explicitly excused police who failed to perform their central duty intervening to prevent violence. In Castle Rock, Jessica Gonzalez sued police for failing to enforce a restraining order resulting in the murder of her three young daughters by her estranged husband. The court ruled that the restraining order did not constitute the property interest necessary to create a police duty to protect. Thus, alongside opinions of facilitating police violence, the court has given the police permission to do nothing, arguably even in the school shooting, such as the one in Uvalde. But what has fueled the over-policing under protection dynamic even more is the legal backdrop. It is impossibly broad set of responsibilities we have given police. The vast majority of what we ask of police does not involve intervening to prevent violence. Instead, we've mostly tasked police with filling in for the social safety net we've cut to bits to deal with the fallout of addiction or response to people in mental health crises. We've even directed police to focus on goals that can run counter to public safety, such as revenue generation, or that could be readily done by non-police, such as traffic enforcement. So if it seems that the officers on the scene in Uvalde were not particularly primed to intercede to prevent violence, that is our fault as much as theirs. Again, I'm reading from the Washington Post here. We have allowed policing to drift too far from what should be its core role. We know from past school shootings what this means. The people who sign up to be school police aren't actually signing up to confront armed gunmen, and they don't always do so when the need arises. If we want a policing system that protects children from violence, and our schools are in our neighborhoods, we need to stop using police to do so much that has so little to do with preventing violence. Focusing police on its core function would make it feasible to select for policing only those special individuals who are able to show great restraint, even as they are ready to give their lives for a stranger on any given workday. We might not be able to fill the current ranks of about a million officers if we elevate entry criteria in this way, but as Uvalde underscores in policing, quality is way more important than quantity. We also need to be more judicious in how we direct police to prevent violence. The Texas legislative report found that Less serious school alerts of bailouts, people fleeing from car crashes used by high-speed law enforcement, diluted the significance of such alerts and dampened the response of both law enforcement and educators to the genuine emergency of this active shooter. In other words, too much policing can contribute to underprotection and policing develops a boy who cried wolf quality. Rethinking the role of police and public safety is often discussed as necessary to reduce the harms of over-policing. Uvalde is an illustration of the corollary to that proposition. Fewer police with a more focused role might provide better protection from violence to the communities they serve. That's Christy Lopez writing in the Washington Post. I do not agree with all of her premises or her overall conclusion. I agree with some of it, but not all of it. But we read it because it's a contracting view to what we've been discussing here and the blame we've been laying at law enforcement's feet. So what say you? Read the entire piece. It's linked in the show notes. Let us know what you think at hertelshowgmail.com, at hertelshow on the Twitter. We'll hash out what you think about it. Well, that's what we do. We present a wide range of views, we turn down the noise, and we try to discern the times for ourselves. More Hard Tell right after this. Back to Hertel. Okay, we're going to end with some good news like we always do. We have covered multiple times on this segment where we usually talk about charity giving or good works or things like that. Twitch. Now, Twitch is the streaming service, very popular amongst gamers, but also gaining a lot of ground in culture and politics, uh, the cutting edge of politics. And the next wave of commentators is actually looking to get into Twitch. You'll hear more and more of it. However, it's still predominantly a gaming platform. But they have found ways to raise millions and millions and millions of dollars for charity. We've covered those stories before here on Herd Tell. The problem was they didn't have a direct way to do it within the platform. Twitch is working on that. This is from TubeFilter.com. Creators have raised millions of dollars for good. 
caused by hosting charity live streams on Twitch. And it is eye popping numbers talking tens of millions of dollars they have raised for charity. Good for them. But they've never had a built in tool to do it until now. Twitch announced this week that it is beta testing Twitch charity, a suite of fundraising tools that lets creators set streams to charity mode uh, right inside of the site. Active tools for automatic fund collection and donation. Quote, the hassles of running a charity stream, tracking donations, converting subs and bits, managing multiple programs and apps at once, are what we're hoping to make as a minimally hassly as possible, the platform wrote in a company blog post. Setting a stream to charity mode will put a donate to charity button in the stream window along with a tracker that allows the show donations building up to hitting the stream's fundraising goals. Twitch charity will also automatically donate the money raised to the streamer's cause of choice. Previously, creators would have to tally up and donate the money themselves, and it's become common practice for them to post screenshots of their donation as proof to the viewers money actually went to the cause. It's also worth noting here that third-party companies like Stream Elements have built numerous plugins and widgets that help them do that. This is just the first time that Twitch is offering an on-site tool. Love the accountability of that. Always look for that in your charitable giving. So while we talk about giving as close to the source as possible, accountability is a big deal. Now, donations made during the charity stream modes will be received and tailored by the PayPal Giving Fund, and they will be granted to your recommended charity in accordance with its policy, Twitch said. Twitch will take no cuts of the donations for streamers making money and raising money for important causes is easier and transparent. For viewers, it should make supporting those causes simpler, cleaner, and more impactful. Good on Twitch. This is a great idea. This is a community, as we've covered, has raised tens of millions of dollars. If you're not familiar with gaming culture, there's a lot of uh, suspicion that some older people view it. They're doing some good work. They're good folks down there. Just like everybody else, there's good folks and bad folks. This is a great thing. Good on Twitch. If you're into streaming, check it out. Make sure you donate to the causes of your choice. Look for what we talked about there, though. Make sure they're being accountable, showing you where that money's going. Always a good thing. That'll do it for her tell for today. Uh, we are really rolling with great guests, great topics, no shortage of news to cover. We're going to keep doing what we do, though. Turn down the noise, get to the information we need to discern the times we live in. Can't do it without you. Thank you so much for joining us. Make sure you're subscribing. Whatever platform you're getting this on, iTunes, Spotify, iHeartRadio, any of the podcasting platforms, thrilled to have you. Let us know that's what you're watching on. If you're on the YouTube or the Facebook page for our radio partner, Big Talker Live, or on the Big Talker Live app, let us know you're on that. We'd love to keep track of you. We'd love your feedback. At Show on the gmail.com, at Show on the Twitter. There's also multiple links in the show notes, different pro things we have involving Tell that you can look into. So until we see you again on whatever version of Herd Tell you're listening to, we hope you're well. We hope you're well fed. We'll talk to you real soon for more Herd Tell. All the music on Herd Tell is provided under a creative content license from monstercat.com.